long before our losties ever set foot on the island, it was an Eden, a place of lasting life. We know this because of the statue of Tauret. It was built as a tribute to glorify the goddess of fertility. The ancient Egyptians saw Tauret as a protective deity. She was a mother goddess and a patron of childbirth. She was thought to help women in pregnancy and in labour, and she helped to ward off evil spirits and demons who intended harm to the mother or child. Now, we could do a whole video about Tauret and her symbolic meaning within the context of the overall series. Various myths demonstrate that she also played a role in helping the souls of the deceased pass through the underworld on their way to rebirth. Sound familiar? But the real question here is, why would the Egyptians build such a statue on the island in the first place? Because the island was a baby-making factory for the people that came to its shores. Remember, Juliet tells Sun in Season 3 episode DOC that male sperm counts are five times the average when on the island. This means that during the Egyptian settlement some two millennia ago, there must have been a baby boom where children were being born regularly, perhaps even unexpectedly. Men and women who could not previously conceive suddenly found themselves getting pregnant. To the Egyptians, these children were being gifted to them by their fertility goddess. But it wasn't Tauret, or any demigod for that matter. It wasn't even Jacob behind this apparent miracle. It's the electromagnetic energy beneath the island itself that causes the increased sperm counts. The energy that flows out from the source at the heart of the island. We know this energy has the ability to heal wounds and ailments. It does this by reversing injuries to a prior state in time, regenerating damaged tissue and cells. This is how Locke's broken back was healed. The energy can also cure diseases by reversing the effects, whether that be forms of cancer or other potentially life-threatening illnesses. When people get sick, Rose. Not here. Here, they get better. We've previously discussed why Ben's tumour was not healed, and how that demonstrates that the light has a will of its own in what it does and does not heal. Surely Ben had been taken to the Temple Spring after his diagnosis, and surely he was placed in the waters in the hopes and expectations that the waters would heal him. Only when he emerged, his cancer was still there. You said no one on this island ever had cancer. You told me that. I know what I told you, You told Julia. me you could fix it. You said that. You said that you cured my sister. You lied to me. No, I did not lie to if you. If you can cure cancer, Ben, then why do you have it? This was because the others needed to see and understand that the island no longer wanted Ben as their leader. It was the island's way of communicating that Ben's time was indeed over, and that it was now John Locke's time. A man who had been preordained to lead the others for more than 50 years. A man who was healed instantly upon arriving on the island. The island wanted me to get sick. And it wanted you to get well. My time is over, John. But I digress. It's very easy to get sidetracked when discussing any aspect of Lost. We're not here to talk about the island's ability to heal the sick. We're here to talk about how and why it turned on pregnant women. The point is that the light has reversing effects on both injuries and diseases, but these healing properties are also harmful to early term gestation. Any woman who conceives on the island essentially has a genetic flaw baked into their pregnancy, a flaw that metastasizes during the second trimester. The source's energy treats the growing fetus in the womb as a foreign invader. It's as if the emergent baby is the equivalent of cancer cells duplicating and spreading within the woman's body. This is why the woman's immune system attacks the fetus and why her white blood cell count plummets, causing her to slip into a coma. Because the energy is reversing the pregnancy and effectively unmaking the baby. And this rather horrific process is ultimately what kills the mother during the second trimester. It's pretty grim, isn't it? The epilogue, the new man in charge, further confirms how the energy is the cause of these issues. 
During the orientation for the Hydra, Pierre Chang uses polar bears as the primary example of what happens when a pregnant mammal is directly exposed to this energy. Remember, be sure to confirm that the female bears have not been impregnated before transport, as the electromagnetic levels at the orchid have an extremely harmful effect on early term gestation. As long as the energy is kept contained beneath the island, there are no issues with pregnancies. In fact, when there is a barrier between the light's awesome power and human beings, they can enjoy the benefits of its healing properties, especially when that energy is diffused and channeled through water. Close proximity is fine, but direct exposure is almost always fatal. After the incident of 1977, there was a large amount of electromagnetic fallout across the island. Essentially, it's a form of atmospheric radiation, and over the ensuing years, heavy bursts of this very same radiation was building up beneath the Swan site, and being discharged into the atmosphere every 108 minutes. This ongoing leak and fallout from the Swan site is directly responsible for the deaths of pregnant women on the island. So, how do we know this? In Season 5, the writers clearly show us that babies can be conceived and born on the island, at least up until the year 1977. This is evidenced with Amy Goodspeed giving birth to Ethan. They draw attention to this fact through Sawyer and Juliet's conversation. Don't you understand that every time I try to help a woman on this island give birth, it hasn't worked? Well, maybe whatever made that happen hasn't happened yet. Several episodes later, the incident takes place and Juliet detonates the bomb. From this moment onwards, the electromagnetic fallout from the incident is released into the atmosphere of the island bubble. Now, it's possible that this fallout would have dissipated over time, but because the pocket of energy had become destabilised from Dharma's drilling, the energy continued to leak out and build up beneath the Swan site. All Dharma could do was channel this energy into a reactor, and the reactor is what was behind that sealed off wall that we see early in season 2. The computer was connected to this reactor, and the button discharged the energy build up once it reached critical mass, which means this atmospheric radiation continued to be released on the island for the next 30 years. Juliet detonating the bomb also creates a causality time loop irony, because the woman who came to the island to solve the problem with pregnant women is actually part of the reason for creating this problem in the first place. You see, Jughead's detonation temporarily plugs this leak, and this allows Dharma enough time to finish their construction on the Swan. So because of Juliet's actions, the hatch is built and the computer is installed, and this system is what continues to kill pregnant women for years to come. Julia is, unintentionally, but tragically, the cause of her own suffering in the future. Although, the pregnancy problem was ultimately a smaller price to pay in the grand scheme of things, because had Juliet not detonated the bomb, then the world would simply have ended and no one would have survived. The fallout on pregnant women was an unintended side effect, and a consequence of saving the world. In other words, it was a sacrifice the island demanded. There really isn't anything else that happens on the island after the incident that could have the same lasting effect on pregnancies for decades to come. It has been argued by some fans that the purge was the real cause of this problem, ergo the toxic chemical gases released from the Tempest station that poisoned the air and killed many Dharma Initiative members is chiefly responsible for aborted pregnancies going forward. Yet that isn't how toxic gas works. It disperses in the air, causing immediate fatalities, but then it dissipates, hence why the others could take their masks off, but minutes after the toxic gas was released. The gas wouldn't linger in the island's atmosphere for two decades affecting pregnancies like that. The show never alludes to, nor indicates this idea. The pregnancy issues were caused exclusively by the leak from the energy pocket beneath the swan. Only women much further into their pregnancy, who had conceived off-island, ever had a fighting chance of bringing a baby to term on the island and surviving the process. Hence why both 
Danielle Rousseau and Claire Littleton give birth without incident. Both women conceived on the mainland, and arrived on the island well into their second trimesters. Charles Widmore was in charge of the others during the 1980s, but it's made clear that he doesn't care about the pregnancy problem, or whether or not his people can conceive, as evidenced by his lack of interest in Rousseau's baby. In fact, it's just the opposite. He actually wants Benjamin Linus to kill baby Alex. It's reasonable to assume that Charles Widmore had become embittered. Eloise Hawking had left him and the island behind to raise their son without Charles in the boy's life. We also know that he had conceived Penelope Widmore with an outsider during the 1970s, several years before Daniel Faraday's birth. Children were not of interest to him until his later years, after his banishment. However, we know that Ben was driven his whole life by the insecurity and guilt of his own existence. His mother had died whilst giving birth to him as a baby, and he spent the rest of his childhood being reminded of that fact and tormented by his alcoholic father, Roger Linus. After Ben usurped Widmore and became the new leader of the others, he moved a large majority of them into the barracks to embrace the technology left behind, and to fix the problems that Widmore had ignored for well over a decade. Ben became obsessed with trying to fix this pregnancy problem for his people. On a psychological character level, Ben probably felt that if he could save the pregnant women of the future, then maybe he could somehow redeem his own misplaced sense of guilt over his mother's death. As a side note related to this, I would like to briefly discuss the character of Annie. Many fans often speculate as to her significance in Ben's past. In the season 3 episode The Man Behind the Curtain, the show draws very specific attention to this young girl. But why? At this point in the game, it seemed apparent that the writers wanted to explore Ben's past in more detail at a later date. However, those plans never came to fruition perhaps as a result of the writer's strike during season 4, or simply because the show no longer demanded that this backstory be told. Considering how much story is told in the narrative juggernaut of season 5, it's no surprise that certain plot lines were dropped. What I'm about to suggest is nothing more than a speculation about where the Annie character might have gone had the writers been able to implement their original plans for her. It seems implied that Annie was going to become Ben's childhood sweetheart, a girl that he grows up alongside and falls in love with. Years after defecting to the others, perhaps she was going to get pregnant but die in childbirth, and maybe this is what would have fueled Ben's obsession to solve the pregnancy crisis. It might also be what Harper Stanhope is referring to in Season 4 episode The Other Woman, when she tells Juliet, Of course he has. You look just like her. I'm sorry? Annie's death in childbirth might have been the original motivation for Ben to usurp Charles Widmore from power, and also the reason why he was compelled to take Alex as a baby and raise her as his own, to replace this child that he tragically lost. There has never been any confirmations about these ideas from the showrunners, to my knowledge, but that was always my assumption of why Annie was introduced, and what significance she might have had to the story in future. Either way, the character and any ideas attached to her were dropped by the writer's room. All the groundwork was laid for this subplot to happen, but it never materialised. As it now stands, we can deduce that Annie was simply the only friend that Ben had as a child on the island, and they shared an early bond that was cut short after she left the island during the evacuation of 1977 with many of the other families. It was the only real relationship Ben ever had with someone on the island that was pure in some way hence why he holds on to the memory so dearly. And Harper Stanhope's comment can now be read as being more Freudian, because Juliet does look like someone from Ben's past, wouldn't you say? Mom. Once Ben took control over the others, he set them to work about fixing this pregnancy conundrum by harnessing the properties and resources of the island, and using Mytilos Bioscience as their research arm on the mainland but by the time they had entered the 21st century, they reached a dead end. In 2001, they discovered a promising medical fertility specialist named Juliet Burke. Through study and surveillance, they learned that Juliet had helped her infertile sister conceive, which in itself is a remarkable scientific breakthrough, and Ben wanted Juliet on the island ASAP. 
As a result, he quickly becomes obsessed with Juliet. And while Juliet is indeed a beautiful woman, I don't think that attraction was the primary motivator in why Ben wanted to keep her trapped on the island with him. I don't see his obsession as unrequited love, per se. I think it's more complex than that. Juliet represented the person who could save the island community from further tragedy, and therefore validate Ben's leadership at the same time. If he could resolve this problem once and for all, it would show his people that he is still the man for the job and a worthy island leader. And at the same time, on a psychological level, Juliet's potential success might help him redeem his own guilt over his mother's death. In other words, Juliet was Ben's chance at both maintaining his power and delivering his personal salvation. She represented so many important things to him, and his feelings for her stem from this. So until she resolved this island-wide problem, she would never truly be free of him. Why? You're asking me why? After everything I did to get you here, after everything I've done to keep you here, how can you possibly not understand that you're mine? But after years of failed pregnancies and many deaths of friends and colleagues, Juliet reached an impasse in her research, and this is why the others were extremely interested in Claire Littleton's arrival. Season 2 episode, Maternity Leave, essentially shows us what happened to Claire after she was abducted by Ethan. She was initially intended to be a control case. Ethan was administering injections of the serum in secret to ensure a safe delivery occurred. However, once he was exposed as a ringer among the survivors, Ethan broke ranks and kidnapped Claire. Juliet and Tom Friendly both indicate that this was not supposed to happen. Claire was to be extracted in secret at a later time. We tried to save her life. By kidnapping her. No, that wasn't supposed to happen. She was our control case. I had developed a serum that I thought would reverse what was happening to her. Ethan was administering the injections. But then you found out that he wasn't on the plane. The census. I interviewed everyone. One of them isn't in the manifest. He wasn't on the plane. So he improvised. Ethan took her to the staff medical station, where he monitored her pregnancy and continued to administer injections of the serum to ensure safe delivery. This serum appears to be an evolution of what Dharma had been vaccinating its people with several decades prior, following the incident. Juliet Burke claimed to have developed this particular iteration of the serum specifically to help pregnant women. Claire was kept drugged throughout most of her time in the staff. Her water appears to be laced with some kind of narcotic. Mm. What? That's really sour. Is it? Mm. I hadn't noticed. The others prepared to induce labour and deliver the baby, even if it killed Claire. Now, Ethan is clearly unhappy about doing this. He seems to have grown fond of Claire. But we know that Ben is behind the scenes pulling the strings and most likely insisting on saving the baby over the mother. This is his obsession, after all. But, as fate would have it, his so-called adopted daughter, Alex Russo, saves Claire from this likely fatal operation and releases her into the jungle where she's found by Alex's real mother, Danielle Russo. I suppose we shouldn't mistake coincidence for fate. Claire delivers her baby safely into the arms of Kate, who becomes the future interim mother of Aaron. We can assume that her pregnancy is successful because she conceived off-island and was already close to the due date by the time she crashed, much like Russo. It is possible that the serum helped to ensure the safe delivery, but we also know that Juliet was telling some half-truths in the scene where she explains what happened to Claire. Either way, Aaron became the first baby born on the island in 16 years, the first since Alexandra Russo in 1988. So, was the pregnancy issue resolved? While it's never expressly stated or explained within the show itself, we can make a logical deduction as to what became of the island's pregnancy problems. Think of it this way. If destabilising this specific pocket of energy beneath the swan is what created the original problem in the first place, then surely destroying that pocket entirely would resolve that problem. As an audience watching for the first time, we don't realise that the energy beneath the swan is the cause of the fertility issues until the end of Season 5, but once that becomes clear, we can retroactively understand that the problem must have been started there. 
which also means that problem was unintentionally fixed several seasons prior when Desmond turned the failsafe key and blew up that pocket of energy, which means Sun could have had her baby on the island without the risk of dying. The problem that Juliet had come there to solve had actually been fixed, she just didn't know it. Going into the future, after the Island War of 2007, Hurley would ascend to the leadership after all of these issues had been resolved, including the pregnancy problem, and his number two Ben would live to see his only ever dream finally achieved, to see babies born on the island, and the mothers survive, to find salvation in the next generation, and a new era. As for Juliet, in a way she was the modern day equivalent and embodiment of Tauret, a protector of mothers and children, only instead of magic, she used medicine. We even see her helping a few lost souls find their way through the afterlife, and into rebirth. Now, I'm not saying she was literally Tara, don't get me wrong, but whenever I look at that statue and everything that it is supposed to represent within the series mythology, I can't help but think of the one person on the island who strived the most to protect mothers and save children. Juliet was a guardian of the island in her own right, and while tragically she never lived to see her work finally complete, Juliet Burke ultimately sacrificed her life so that others could live. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to keep this channel alive. Follow the links in the description to donate to the Patreon, and join me on the island. And until the next time, stay lost.